So um, last week I started a series called uh, The Essential Church, and we're going to do part two today. Before we do, let's pray. Father, thank you today for your word. Thank you today for your gift. Thank you for the anointing, God, that you put in this house to be able to expound the word in such a way that would bring hope, life, and strength. Help me today, Father, to stay in the flow of your spirit, to hear your word. And God, as the word comes forth, help us as leaders, and attenders, God, as onlookers, to be able to have a heart that receives, a mind to perceive, God, and a will to do all that you teach us to do. In the most blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. All right, you ready for the word? Um, our key scripture last week was Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound of heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were setting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues of fire, and one sat, on each, and one sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We're talking about the day of Pentecost. We talked about the day that the promise was not only given, but the promise was fulfilled. And that's this moment here in the book of Acts. Not only was the promise given, but it was fulfilled. And I really believe that us gathering on the 31st, the day coming back from this pandemic, is significant. I really believe that God's going to do something super significant uh, on the 31st like he did here. Some of you have been waiting on a promise, and I just believe it, man. You can call me crazy. You can call me whatever you want. But I believe God's going to make good on the promises he's given to you and your family. God's going to do something special like he did then. One of the things that we dealt with that he sends, one of the things that we received on the day of Pentecost was his comfort. The key scripture for that thought was Matthew, excuse me, John chapter 14, and it said this, If you love me, keep my commandments. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither knows him nor known of him. But you know him, for he dwells within you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. God sent his comfort. And I really want to talk a little bit today about comfort. Why is it important that we understand that Jesus sent comfort? For today's key scripture, that was last week. I just want to recap a little bit. Today's key scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. And, and it says that, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, blessed be the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of, the Father of all mercies and comfort. And we're going to stop right there for just a minute. The Father of all mercies and comfort. God is the God of all comfort. Why is that important for us today? Well, here's what I know. Let's, let's, let's pull aside the pandemic for a while. Did you ever hear the story of the person who has everything they could have ever imagined? Matter of fact, they have everything you wish you had. And yet somehow they reach a point where they find no more joy in life and they wind up taking their own life. Did you ever see that story? Maybe some of you know somebody like that. Did you ever see the person who seemed to have it all together, and yet they reached a point that no matter what they had, they just, it wasn't enough, and they wound up taking their life. I can say this to you, look, you'll see this in the athletic world, you'll see this in the financial world, you'll see this in the entertainment world, you'll see this in every aspect of life. People reach a point where they just can't seem to be comforted, and what do they do? They act out. Some of them take their own life. Watch this. Some of them walk away from good families. Some of them go into alcoholism. Some of them go into drug addiction. And it's not, it's not that they're incapable of overcoming. It's that within their own situation, they, watch this, are you ready? They can't seem to find comfort. And when you can no longer find comfort, the human innate, sinful nature starts seeking other ways to, to dull the pain, to numb the pain, to remove the, the things that, that are no longer bringing comfort to us. And so I want you to know that, that there is a greater pandemic in America and the world than COVID-19. Uh, not, I'm not dishonoring or, or de minimizing COVID-19. But many more people today, watch this, will die from the lack of results of comfort, from no resolution to their comfort, than will of any other sickness in the world today. So when I tell you the church is essential, when I tell you you as a church body are essential, what I'm saying to you today is, where are people going to run to for comfort? Where are people going to go to to find strength in, in hard times? Who can console them in the middle of their struggles? 
And, and man, I am so glad that we're here today. I'm glad that we don't have a God who runs from trial. I'm, I'm glad that we don't have a God who in moments of pandemic or moments of, of struggle or, or moments of tragedy, God doesn't run and hide. God has been, is, and will always be present for you and I who need comfort. And so I want to say to you, the church is essential because we are the distributors of the comfort that Jesus has for us. In 1 Corinthians, again, chapter 1 and verse 3, the word comfort here, I want to share this with you. Uh, the English word comfort is from the Latin confrontis, which means, watch this, I love this, brave together. Brave together. The word Jesus uses in John chapter 14 that we talked about, the Holy Spirit or comforter, is paraclete. This word is found in John uh, 14, and it's used again here in, in 2 Corinthians. So when the Bible says he sends a comforter, what says, I love this, man. He sends somebody to be alongside you. Be alongside you. Um, anybody remember being really young and having moments of fear? What, what did you reach out to when you had a moment of fear? I promise you, even if you had the Linus syndrome and you had a favorite blanket, it wasn't your blanket that you first reached out to. What did you first reach out to? Many of you would have said this in a moment of darkness. They shut off the light and it's dark all around you. Here's what you would say. Mama, mama, mom, daddy, daddy. What, what are you calling to? You're calling to the one you know has always been by your side. And here's what the Holy Spirit is saying, right? Mother and father would leave you and forsake you, but I will never leave you nor forsake you. I want you to know that I'm going to come alongside you. And I feel this right now by the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure what you're going through, but I feel like this moment we're in right now is divinely orchestrated. I feel like God's doing something super direct, super specific right now. That somebody watching, somebody in this building is feeling a sense of, I'm doing this by myself. I'm doing this all alone and I can't do it anymore. If you have been forsaken, abandoned, rejected, or left alone in any shape, way, or form, I want to encourage you today. He comes alongside of you. And not only does he come alongside of you, but he comes bravely alongside of you. Listen, <laughs> the last person I want to be next to in the middle of a trial is a wimp. The last person I want to be next to in the middle of a struggle is somebody who's afraid to fight. And I love that paraclete means not only does he come alongside, but he comes along with an attitude of bravery. Holy Spirit is with you, and he means business. He wants to get some things done. Now, I'm going to give you three areas that he sends his comfort to. Three areas that hopefully may resonate with you that the Holy Spirit sends his comfort to. And here's number one. He sends his comfort in times of affliction. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God of our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction. Who comforts us in our affliction. The term affliction is thephilippus. Thephilippus. Yeah, don't correct my uh, Greek, but there it is for you anyways. The etymology meant to squeeze or crush. God wants to be there when everybody else is squeezing you or crushing you. This could be like the processing of grapes to make wine or the crushing of wheat to make flour. But it usually can be used figuratively like for a physical or an emotional or traumatic crush in our lives. Sometimes um, we, we get crushed. Sometimes we get squeezed. And it's not necessarily anything of your own doing, but it's what the enemy is trying to do uh, like a boa constrictor. He will come over you and he's trying to squeeze you until there's no more breath inside of you. And, and many of you are going through that right now. I don't know if it's maybe your family situation or, or maybe it's your business situation right now where you feel afflicted. Affliction is not something that you do or bring upon yourself, but affliction is that thing which other people or other situations or circumstances bring upon you. Sometimes you're afflicted and it's nothing that you did wrong. Sometimes you're afflicted and it's nothing of your own doing. But the enemy, who is like a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, is out there trying to get you. 
He's out there trying to bring you down. He's out there trying to level out your life so that you can't progress. And how does he do that? He comes and he squeezes and he starts crushing and he starts, watch this, denying you oxygen so that you can no longer expand, breathe, and move forward. What do you do in moments of crushing? What do we do in moments where we feel like the life is being squeezed right out of us? Please remember that we have the sufferings of Christ as ours in abundance. In other words, you can look at all of the moments that Christ was squeezed. We can look at all the moments that he was afflicted, and that becomes a strength to us because we can also see that in Paul, in Paul's life. So if, watch this. I'm going to make a, a real powerful statement here. I want you to stay with me. We share in Christ's death and resurrection. Let me explain to you what share means. The person who is receiving the sharing is not the owner of the food, right? If somebody shares their food with you, it's not your food. You probably didn't pay for that food. You probably didn't harvest that food. It's the willingness of somebody else to share that food with you. So when we say we share in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, anybody here die recently? Anybody here crucified recently? So here's the good thing, right? When you share somebody's food, you get to eat something you didn't prepare. You get to eat something you had nothing to do with. Jesus shared with us his death, burial, and resurrection. So watch this. In times of affliction, we can share with him in his times of struggle and suffering. So I, I want you to understand this, that sometimes when we think that comfort of trial or comfort of struggles or comfort in the moment of crushing is the Lord taking us out of crushing. Lord taking us out of the struggle. But that's not what he said. He said, I will come alongside of you. And I want you to share in the power of my resurrection. I want you to share in the results of my suffering. But I also want you to come alongside and share in some of my suffering. When you're being crushed, and you've done nothing but be faithful to the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit comfort you as you go through. When you're doing what's right, but the enemy comes to raise a, a standard against you, don't complain. These, in these moments, you let the Holy Spirit come through you. Come on, Paul suffered. Jesus suffered. Peter suffered. The early church suffered. Today we're celebrating Memorial Day and the amazing life of all those men and women who paid the ultimate price so that we can be free today. And we're grateful for every one of you who have served and gave your life. Those of you whose, whose families right now uh, uh, bear the weight of a lost husband, bear the weight of a lost daughter, a lost mother. Thank you so much for what you're doing. But let us also remember that the reason the church is here is because there were some people who were not only willing to share in the salvation that was brought about by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but they were also willing to share in the struggle, in the crushing, in the pressing. So sometimes it's not God getting you out, it's God getting you through. God's getting you through. And how is he doing it? He's not doing it from the corner. You know, I, I love uh, sports because many of, uh, of you have the problem I have. If everybody could play the way I play on the sidelines. I'm on the sidelines and I'm telling everybody, come on, hit the ball. Come on, how can you do that? It's so easy to be amazing on the sidelines. But once you get in that field... Come on, I'm so glad that Jesus is not on the sidelines shouting, you can make it. He's not at the finish line saying, come on, come on, come on. Jesus is in interjecting himself or injecting himself into the situation you're going through to come alongside you so that you can make it to the end of your promise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for that. We'll take that. How do I get through affliction? You hold on to his promise. Psalms chapter 119 verse 50 says this. This is my comfort in affliction, that your promises give me life. Your promises give me life. Some of you say, Pastor, you know, I've, I've never felt Jesus in the middle of affliction. That's because perhaps maybe you don't understand Jesus yet. The Bible says you only have, well, he doesn't say it, but I'll say this about the Bible. And I have this, the Bible substantiated, you only have as much of God as you have of his word. So if you're in the middle of a trial and you don't have the word of God, you feel alone. 
But when you're in the trial and you have the promises of God, you can feel the paraclete of God. You can feel the God, God coming alongside of you and comforting you in the middle of your trials. And so here's what David said in Psalms 119. My comfort in my affliction is that your promise gives me life. You want to know how to get through your affliction with the Lord along your side? Hold on to the word of God. It gives you life. Here's another promise in uh, Psalms chapter 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What do you say to yourself when you're in affliction? What do you say to yourself when the world seems to be crashing in around you? Goodness and mercy are going to follow me, and they're going to catch me. I'm not going to live this way forever. This is not the total sum of my life. I got a promise that goodness and mercy will catch up with me. That's how we live, and we feel the paraclete of God. The Spirit of God beside us. Here's another place we need comfort, and the Holy Spirit comes in comfort. He comes, number two, in times of fear. He comes in times of fear. Now, I want to quantify this because a lot of us super religious people go like, Pastor, I, I live by faith. I don't got fear. No. The truth is at one point or another, you're going to contend with some level of fear. And can I say this to you? If you're not contending with some level of fear, it's because you're not doing anything with your life. Are you with me? If you're going to invest, there's a level of fear you got to overcome. You're going to get married, there's a level of fear you got to overcome. Come on, you going to have a baby? Well, you know, if you're a woman, you're going to have a baby, there's a level of fear you got to overcome. And, and so it doesn't really matter in life what you're going to do. There's going to be a level of fear that you're going to contend with. So, so what do we have in the moment of fear? And the truth is, if we can be honest, man, sometimes we, 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 we try to act courageously, but that fear will get the best of you if you're not careful. That fear will wreck you if you're not careful. It'll make you say, listen, can be honest? Some of you say things in times of fear that you would never say when you're not afraid. Some of us, watch this, let go of things that we should never let go of when we're fearful. And so then how do you not lose who you are when you're in fear? How do you keep who you are in fear? How do you feel like uh, not giving up? How do you not surrender in fear? I love this scripture. You're familiar with it, but I, I picked it out today in a couple of different translations. I want to read this here first in the voice. This is Psalms chapter 23, verse 4. Even in the undenying shadows of death and darkness, I am not overcome by fear because you are with me in those dark moments near with your protection and your guidance and he enters and he answers and he ends by saying i am comforted isn't that amazing he says i he said because you are with me in those dark moments near with you near with your protection and guidance i am comforted how are we going to survive in times of fear here it is watch this know that he's alongside of us with protections and guidance Old, Test uh, uh, Old King James said, thy rod and thy staff, right? Rod and thy staff, that Jesus is there with guidance and protection. Uh, uh, so what's this in verse, uh, this is the, uh, oh, this is the dark valley broken down. In, in the Greek, the, 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 the verse, or the part of the verse that says dark valley. The psalmist acknowledges that life will not always be categorized by green pastures and quiet waters. In this life, you're going to have somebody that's going to wreck your world. You're going to have somebody or a moment that's going to bring you into a place of insecurity and unsureness. What do we do in this moment? I love this, man. I love this. He said your rod and your staff. Your rod and your staff. And the voice called it two different things. He said your protection and your guidance. Let me slow down here for a moment. The problem with most believers is that we are either with our mind serving God or we are with our heart serving God. Let me break this down for you. We either pursue God intellectually, or watch this, or we pursue God experientially. So, so, uh, so most believers are half complete in their pursuit of God because we have people who are so in love with the word, but they're never giving their emotions or their heart to God. Are you following? I was raised in a Neo-Pentecost church. We were, we were more driven towards the experience of God. Because watch this. You encounter God with your heart, but you obey God with your mind. 
and you can encounter God. That's Bernie, you and I know, man. We were raised with people who you thought, oh, my God, that person's so holy. Look at the Holy Ghost using them. They shout and dance and yada, yada. Yet something inside of them was so far from God. Their heart was there, but they wouldn't give God their mind. They wouldn't learn. They wouldn't grow. And then you go to churches that are the complete opposite. Man, they quote every scripture. They quote every verse. But there is dry, come on somebody, three days plucked up by the roots. That's what the Bible says. That they have this knowledge of God but are so distant from the power and the demonstration of God that it almost denies the work of God. So then what is it? In fear, you need God's guidance and his protection. So you need the mind of God to protect you and the guidance of God to trust him. You trust with your heart, but you got guidance with your mind. So are you going to overcome fear? How do you overcome fear? you got to have God's wisdom, and you got to have the passion for God. It is his rod and his staff that get us through. And watch that. He uses that to comfort us. He uses that to comfort us. The Passion Translation says this. Fear will never conquer me, for you already have. Just love that. Fear will never conquer me, for you already have. You remain close to me and lead me through it all the way. Your authority is my strength and my peace. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. I absolutely love that God visits us in moments of fear. What are you dealing with today? What are you dealing with today? Are you worried about COVID-19? Now listen to me. There's nothing wrong with being concerned. Today, everybody in this building is wearing a mask. When we come next week, we're going to ask you to wear a mask. Not because we're afraid, but because we're going to use our mind and our heart. We're going to exercise wisdom and passion. Does that make sense? So we're going to use some common sense, right? Everybody's going to wash their hands. The church is going to be sanitized. Everybody's taking vitamin C and vitamin A, right? Everybody's watching their immune system, minimizing coffee or things that hinder your immune system. Don't sit there and, and, and not take care of your immune system and go, Lord, we trust you. No, God doesn't want just your trust. He wants your mind too. So we've got to use our mind. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. And in case... I don't know about you, and I, I'm just going to do this because I feel it's got me, Derek, through more things than anything else. You know, my parents uh, were amazing people, amazing people. And some of what the old church did for us, the new church just doesn't grab. I wanted to read this to you in some newer translations, but it just does not poetically, emotionally, uh, intellectually grab you the way it did in some of the older writings. So here's a moderate version that still holds to some of the, what I feel, uh, essence of the old uh, writings. This is Psalms chapter 91, and it says this, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under the wings and under his wings will you find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. So you will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your right and t at your left side and 10,000 to your right side but not but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes to see the recompense of the wicked because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the most high who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague shall come near your tent. For he will demand, uh, command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up. Lest you strike your foot against the stone, you will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample under your feet. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. 
when you don't know where to find comfort, get the Word of God and let Him come alongside of you and let Him build you up and encourage you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen, somebody. Number three, our heavenly, or excuse me, comfort shows up. God sends his comforter in our heavy burdens. I'm just going to be honest with you, man. I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, some people are carrying a little bit more weight than you are. And, and in that same honesty, I can tell you, you're carrying a little more weight than somebody else might be. Two things I want to say about that. Some of you got bigger shoulders. You should be carrying more weight. Some of you got made stronger than others. You should be carrying more weight. You shouldn't carry the weight that somebody else carries because that's the weight they're carrying. You should carry that weight because it's appropriate to your abilities. God's design. And I want to say this, no matter how much weight. Did, did that come across right? Did you kind of get that? That, that some of you um, only want to carry five pounds because your neighbor's only carrying five pounds. But that's five pounds is breaking your neighbor and they're sweating carrying it. You carry five pounds with your pinky and all you want to carry is five pounds because that's all somebody else is carrying. Jesus dealt with that really severely with Peter when Peter said, hey, what about John? And Jesus said, John, none of your business. I'm talking to you right now. Sometimes we got to come to recognize that God wants us to carry weight that other people can't carry. Not that it's not heavy. It is heavy. But it, their weight isn't heavy to you. Have you ever looked at somebody and go, Psst, I could do that in my sleep. I promise you there's things they can do that you're struggling with that they can do in their sleep. Because we're all designed to have an ability to carry. But here's what happens, man. Sometimes when you step up to the plate and you do all that God's asking you to do, the burden becomes heavy. And you may not realize this, but a lot of people have stopped serving God, not because of the pastor, not because of the preacher, not even because of things that happen in church. Many people quit their walk of God with God uh, because the burden is heavy. Many people, watch this, walk out of their family, not because you're a bad wife, but because he couldn't handle the burden. Not because you're a bad husband, but because she couldn't handle the burden. Many people quit businesses. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to find you right where you're at right now. They don't quit businesses because it's a bad idea or a bad concept. They quit because the burden is heavy. And i got to be honest with you today. Heavy burdens are not reason to quit. In this life, we're going to have tribulation. In this life, we're going to have some struggles. Well, then, how do people whose burdens are so heavy find the strength to go on? I'll tell you how. They need a comforter. Where do they find the comforter that's going to be able to come into their lives in the middle of affliction? They find them at church in God's house. Where do they find comfort in times of fear when they feel like nobody else is with them? They find them in church in God's house. Where do they find comfort when their burdens are too heavy? They find them in God's house. I love this scripture. I want you to hear with me as I get ready to end my conversation today. This is Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Then Jesus said, come to me. And I want to stop here for just a moment, and I want to say this to you, that Jesus never says, come to me, to anybody. Come on, listen to me. Jesus always said, follow me. Jesus, what, what must I do? Follow me. To the disciples, pick up your cross and follow me. Jesus is always saying, follow me. It is only in this one instance that Jesus says, come to me. Let's finish the verse. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and caring, heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. When you decide to get up under the load that Jesus has for you, whether it's being a good husband, whether it's being a good steward, whether it's being a good wife, whatever the load that you have to carry, when it gets heavy and it feels like you can't go on, Jesus didn't say, come on, keep going. He didn't say, you can do it. He's not shouting from the corner. Jesus said, come to me. Let me come underneath you and I'll get under that burden with you and I'll help you lift that. You're not going to lift that by yourself. 
I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to give you energy. I'm going to give you new vision. I'm going to give you fresh insight. I'm going to give you more love for your family, more insight for your business. Come to me. I'm the source of everything. Today you may find yourself under a heavy burden, but I can hear the Holy Spirit saying to you, come to me and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Again, he says this. He says, take my yoke upon you. If you know anything about a yoke, oxen were run in tandems. So what he says is, is if you can just see Jesus pulling all by himself or you pulling all by yourself. And what he does is he opens the yoke and he says, come on, get beside me and we'll pull together. That's the image that Jesus is sending to us. The problem with most of us today, if I could just be honest, is that humility was not big in Jesus' day. It was not a valued virtue. It was not a valued uh, uh, tradition or it's not expression of life. To be humble was really looked down upon. But Jesus said, come to me and I will give you rest. In other words, Jesus, watch this, is leading humility. And he says to them, I will come inside, I will come, excuse me, and give you strength. Paul in Philippians chapter one, chapter 2 and verse 3, he, he urges us, he says, in lowliness of mind, each other counting himself better than one another. In other words, look at each other and want to come alongside of one another. I love this verse, when you're feeling like heaviness is around you. You know this in Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. That's enough there, right? Likewise, the Spirit helps us in a witness when you don't know what to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself comes alongside you, joins you in your yoke, and intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. Too deep for words. I started off reading 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 34, 3 through 4. And I want to end by reading the same verse only further along. He says, who comforts us in verse 4 in all of our afflictions so that we might be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I believe this with all my heart today, that the reason you and I have been comforted is so that we can be a comfort to somebody else. The reason you made it through it's not because you're strong. It's not because you're able. It's not because you're all that in a bag of chips. The reason you made it through is because God was alongside of you. And just how he comforted you, we need to comfort one another. I love this about the church. Every entity right now is out for itself. Every entity right now is out for self-survival, self perseverance You may not know this historically, but it's in your history books. Bernie, you might know this. That in the Roman Empire, any type of birth defect was considered a curse. So when parents would have a child who was born without a leg or that was born with Down syndrome or was born with some type of defect, they would literally go outside the city gates and throw the baby outside of the city gates, basically in the, in the refuge, in the, in the dumpsters of, of life. And it was Christians who would go by and pick up those babies, love on them, and raise them. Because they knew that all that they were seeing was a physical picture of a spiritual reality. Because we were the defects that were rejected and thrown away. And it was Jesus who came for a bunch of rejects. They gave his life so that you and I could have hope. And they were comforting others the way they had been comforted. That's the church. That's the essential church. Not enough for you to know Jesus. But Jesus is in my heart, Pastor. Well, Jesus didn't come in your heart, sweetheart, to stay there. I'm just worshiping Jesus in my home. That's good. That's using your mind. But where was he before the COVID-19? 
Now, now I'm glad you found him now, but when this is over, and trust me, I said it last week before all of these announcements that we were on the back side of this. All of a sudden, you're hearing all the national proclamations that this city, this city, this state, this state, I believe the prophetic word is alive in this house. And I want to say this to you. God didn't pull you out so that you can ha have church in your house. We're not coming back to be the church we were six months ago, three years ago, ten years ago. We have got to be the church that is comforting all those who are in fear, all those who are in affliction, and all those who are heavy burdened. we got to come to love the world the way God has loved us. That's the word of God today. Two scriptures I want to give you as I conclude this thought. In Revelations chapter 21 and verse 4. It says this, man, I hope you're hearing this. He will wipe away every tear from your eye. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things are passed away. I want to comfort you with the word of God. And then finally, Psalm 71, verse 21. You will increase my greatness and comfort me again. I'm not sure what you're going through, but I promise you today that Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected so that he could fulfill the promise of John 14. He was going to send us a comforter. And then we would have the authority, the privilege, the opportunity to comfort those around us. Would you pray this week that God would allow you to be a comforter to somebody else? Would you pray this week that the Holy Spirit would come alongside you and comfort you in whatever you may be going through? Because I promise you today, you are not alone. You are not alone. Let me pray with you. Father, today for everybody who's watching, who God may be in a moment of crisis, maybe today, God, they're in affliction. Maybe perhaps today, God, they're dealing with a level of fear. Or somebody today, God, feels so burdened by the choices or responsibilities or privileges they may have. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would blow again like you did in Acts chapter 2. Blow right into that room and let them begin to feel your presence in that place. And then, Holy Spirit, don't only blow in, but descend like fire over their life and come alongside them God and begin to strengthen them remind them God that you're going to wipe away every tear that you're going to dry every eye remind them God that our later our ladder will not be compared to what is coming God our ladder will be greater than our past remind them Father that you've got a great future for them and that you're not shouting from the sidelines make it but you're coming right alongside them today you're filling that room you're filling that house you're filling that heart Lord God just like your word promised you would. And we declare it in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, for those of us who have professed Christ with our heart, but have kept our mind to ourselves. Those of us who have professed Christ with our mind, but have kept our heart to ourselves. God, let the essential church rise. Come alongside of us, Father, and remind us that you've called us to comfort those around us. Let us be the church that comforts the broken, that comforts, God, those who are in affliction, that comforts those who are in fear, and that comforts those under heavy burdens. We ask this in your most blessed name. Amen and amen.